We want to say welcome to those of you who are joining us live for this prophetic insights here at Save to Serve. So again, welcome to you, Save to Serve International. Get your Bibles, get your writing instruments, get your notepads. Please have a heart opened to receive the blessings the Lord has for you this evening. So at this time, I'm going to ask you all to join us in prayer at this time. So bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, we're thankful for your grace and for your mercy. And as we begin this spiritual journey, unfolding Bible prophecies, as we look at current events, grant us wisdom, knowledge, understanding, is our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The subject matter that we're going to deal with tonight will reveal some uncomfortable truths and recount some disturbing and heartbreaking history that to many has been forgotten or altogether ignored. We're going to find out that the history that we're going to share and the horrific details will to a large degree be repeated only this time on a global level, involving the whole world and God's commandment keeping people. We're, refer we're referring to the 1994 yes. genocide that took place in Rwanda 22 years ago, wherein it was estimated that 800,000 people died. The Tutsis were relentlessly and mercilessly slaughtered by the Hutu tribes. Mm. And we're gonna see here the players behind that massacre. Men, women, and children were lost, many of which were Seventh-day Adventists. Look at this BBC News report that came out in 2011. The headline reads, Rwanda, how the genocide happened. And the first paragraph reads, between April and June of 1994, an estimated eight 100,000 Rwandans were killed in the space of 100 days. Now friends, one great reason why we are looking at this history, it is because many of the players and the entities that led to the genocide in Rwanda are presently today sowing seeds and also preparing to bring about another genocide, a great massacre, a great persecution upon God's Bible-believing Christians. I want to read something for you from the book, The Great Controversy, page 285. The chapter entitled, and again, friends, get your notepads, your writing instruments, your Bibles. The chapter entitled, The French Revolution. Just one sentence, it says this, those who will not read the lesson from the book of God are bidden to read it in the history of nations. You know, Pastor, but that principle can also be found in the Bible in Ecclesiastes 1 verse yes. 9. The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done and there is no new thing under the sun. And it's, it's repeated again in Ecclesiastes 3.15. Yes. That which hath been is now, and that which is to be hath already been, and God requireth that which is past. Again, those who will not, and this is going to be one of our thematic statements. Please do not forget this. Those who will not read the lesson from the book of God are bidden to read it in the history of nations. As we began to look at the genocide that transpired in Rwanda, we came across many historians, documentaries, giving detailed accounts of what transpired in the, from the 1950s all the way through to 1994. And as we began to look at these various incidents through, through the lenses of the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, 
we realized that the majority of the players behind the scenes are presently working to bring about a crisis upon God's people. And these players primarily are one, France, the, the, the U.S., the United Nations, the U.N., but specifically, we want to focus on the work of the Belgian government and the Vatican. Look at this statement right here. Before we look at this statement, can I just say sure. it was after World War I that Belgium actually uh, took over Rwanda's government. Yes. Under the League of Nations mandate, they became uh, a part of the, Be well, the Belgians began to govern in mm -hmm. that nation. Mm -hmm. And they also in 1920 became a part of the UN mm -hmm. as well. Well, controlled by the UN, yes. I should say. Look at this statement here. This is from the documentary at minute mark of 409. It says, this is from the BBC and the National Geographic. It's right there, that URL. It says here, Christian democratic movement in Belgium and the Vatican were the chief players in the Rwandan genocide. Now think about this. Most historians will tell you that the genocide that transpired in Rwanda was primarily and only ethnic warfare, tribal warfare, ethnic cleansing. But what I want you all to understand is simply this. The tribal warfare that transpired in Rwanda was only the fruit of a root. So what was at the root of the Rwanda genocide? It was a union of church and state. And when we say church, we are talking about the Roman Catholic hierarchy, popery, the papacy, the Jesuits. Look at this right here. It says here, the Belgian government gave power to the Catholic Church to govern Rwanda. This was in the early 1900s. So here we are seeing here a union of the Vatican with the civil governments in Rwanda. This is the seed that was sown that brought about the genocide. Hmm. Listen carefully. History, friends. It says this. At minute marker 7 minutes 35, it says this. The Tutsis were once supported by the Vatican, but then sought independence and were leaning toward what? Communism. Pope Pius XI condemned the Tutsis. So some of these Tutsis, they realized what was happening, that uh, the Roman Catholic Church united with uh, the government. Civil leaders. Yes, the civil leaders to basically mandate and stipulate um, policies and so forth. And they began to say, this is our country. We need to take our country back. Yes. Why are these foreigners, you know, ruling our country? Mm -hmm. And they began to rise up. They began to rebel. So don't forget that. It says the Tutsis began to seek independence, meaning a separation from the Roman Catholic rule. And it says here, the history says, the Tutsis began to lean toward communism. Now, we're told based on history that communists are atheists. And it seems to me as I do my research, from my perspective, that any group of people that separates itself, themselves, from popery are usually labeled communist. That's interesting. Think about that. Don't forget that. Because what we're seeing here is that the people in Rwanda, many of them said, if Christianity is the way how the Roman Catholic Church says, the way how they act, if that's Christianity, we do not want to have anything to do with that. And they were labeled communists. But the majority were not communists. Look at this carefully here. It says this, Christian Democratic International and the Vatican switched from supporting the Tutsis and began supporting the Hutus, after which began the tribal warfare. Hmm. That's startling right there. So notice, friends, watch this carefully. 
So once the Tutsis said, we are going to take back our government, we do not want to remain under the control of the Vatican, the archbishop in the, in the country. Which was tyranny. It was despotism. Exactly. what it was. Mm -hmm. They were now labeled communist because they separated themselves from Roman Catholicism. After that, the Roman Catholics began to separate themselves from the Tutsis, no longer backing them, but began to back the Hutus. The Hutus were in the majority based on the population number. We are going to back now the Hutus. And not just uh, religiously or ideologically, yes. but back them financially and in other other areas with resources and so forth, as we'll see a little later. And let's go back to this, this paragraph here. It says, once the Tutsis began to separate themselves from the Roman Catholic control and the Christian Democratic International from Belgium began to unite with the Vatican to join with the Hutus. What was the result of this? Tribal warfare. Hmm. Is there another name for that? Tribal warfare today? We Maybe ethnic cleansing, perhaps? And we also see it in what is called race wars. Hmm. So the tribal warfare, the race war was only a fruit of something else. So what was at the root of the tribal warfare, the ethnic battle in Rwanda? It was a union of the Roman Catholic Church and the civil leaders in Rwanda. So we can take this as a template to better understand what is at the root of the majority of the race wars in America, around the world, at the root is the union of church and state. That's right. And not just race wars, but any type of conflict or wars among nations and peoples. You know, friends, if you should go back, again, let's take a look at that statement in GC 285. Those who refuse to learn the lessons from God's holy book will be bidden to learn that lesson in the histories of nations. You know, if you go back and look at the civil war that broke out in the United States of America, if you do your research, you will realize at the root of the civil war in the U.S. was the control of the Vatican, especially behind the Confederate States in the United States of America. Tribal warfare, mm. ethnic clashes and conflicts, race wars, prejudice, at the root is sin, of course, S-I-N, but again, it's the union of church and state. That's right. Don't be fooled and that's by the man of sin. He's called the man of sin. <laughs> the man so of sin. he's behind the wars. Look at this. It says here at minute marker 11 minutes and 15 onward. Hillary, read that for us. What it says. Christian Democratic International and Vatican used the media to spread propaganda. Call, they called Tutsi cockroaches, Satan, cursed by God, and serpents. What does that mean? They were using the press basically to propagate uh, these lies and yes. these uh, ill feelings toward the Tutsis. And people began to turn on them and view them as being cursed by God. So if you're cursed by God, you have no place in our nation. You have to be eradicated completely. That's it. So now, let's go back to the history. So why did the president, prime minister, leaders of Belgium with the Christian democratic movement and the Vatican use the written press in the 50s, 60s, and in the early 90s, the radio station, to call Tutsis cockroaches? Mm. I mean, what do you do with a cockroach when you see it? Exterminate it. What do you do? Mm -hmm. you exactly. Cockroaches, serpents, cursed of God, and that, that tribe, the Tutsis, must be eradicated. Why? What was the reason? What the Tutsi uh, began to do? As a result, they were now to be eradicated. What? to separate themselves from Roman Catholicism. Right. Are we, mm -hmm. friends, are we seeing this? So what is going to happen when God's Bible-believing Christians 
say that they are going to separate completely from Roman Catholicism. Mm. Protest against popery and the papacy. Protest against the ecumenical movement that the Vatican and the papacy are now spearheading. Right. What are they going to be called? They're going to feel, feel the iron hand of Rome, and they're going to be labeled uh, fundamentalist, etc., extremist, Friends, enemies again, of the state, amen. et cetera. Again, let's read that again. It says, those who will not read the lesson from the book of God are bidden to read it in the history of nations. Look with me at Luke 23. Go there with me. Luke chapter 23. Cockroaches. Now, what did they call John the Baptist? A lot of names. Possessed by that, the devil. That he, had, he was possessed by the devil. And what did they call the Tutsis? Satan. Possessed by demons. Why? Cursed by God. Because they did not want to unite with Roman Catholicism. And what's interesting, these Tutsis, you know, I'm sorry, the Hutus, who were backed by the Vatican, yes. they were actually using the Bible. They were using passages of Scripture to... Uh, convince the Hutus that these people need to be uprooted. They mm -hmm. need to be banished, So on the, Again, let's drive from the point. Mm -hmm. On the surface, it was, I don't like your tribe. We differ ideologically, religiously. You see? Mm -hmm. But at the root, it was a religious yes. conflict. That's right. That's what we need to mm -hmm. understand. A religious conflict. Now, if you go back to scripture and history, 99% of all the atrocities that have ever transpired in history, at the root of it, people were killed in the name of religion, mm -hmm. period. So even though they say in, in Rwanda, ethnic tribal warfare, at the root, it was a religious conflict, church and state. Look right. at this, Luke 23, verse number one. Now, what did they label Christ as? Because he was protesting against the apostasies in the church mm -hmm. and the abuses in the nation. They called him a what? A perverter of the government. Right. Now, friends, First I step. want you to understand this. Before I take the next step, I want to make sure you're with us. Go back to that slide. Now, what did they call those Tutsis who refused to unite with the Vatican and to partake in church and state relation? Cockroaches, Cockroaches Satan. Satan. Cursed, cursed by God. God and what? Serpents. Serpents. Now, do you realize that was propaganda? Now, what is propaganda? It's exaggerated lies. Mm -hmm. Nice. To bring about a certain end, purpose, result. Correct. Now, are we seeing the man of sin also using the press, the written media, and right. also videos? Social media. Social media mm -hmm. to push propaganda? Absolutely. Calling a certain group cockroaches, mm -hmm. terrorists, Ter extremists. What now? What now? Mm -hmm. Wow. So those of us who refuse to learn the lesson from God's book will be bidden to read that lesson in what? The history, the history of, of nations. Look at the screen here. Mm -hmm. What did Pope Francis call those who refuse to follow his agenda? Laying aside God's Ten Commandments, those who want to uphold God's Ten Commandments, what did he call them in the media? They are what? Rigid sick people. Sick. sick people. Let's move on. Mm -hmm. We are here, my friends. The Vatican. Look at this. That line says, the second line here is, second sentence. What okay. it says, they. They appear good because they follow the law, but they are concealing something else. Either they are hypocritical or they are sick. So what did the Vatican call those who are determined to uphold God's law? Hypocritical. Hypocrites. All right. Sick. Look at this. Headline, beneath rigidity, there's something else. There's often wickedness. So what did he call those who want to uphold God's law? Wicked. Wicked and that they are rigid. The same propaganda machine as was used in Rwanda from the 1950s to the 90s are now presently being used. Yes. Watch. It says this, headline. He says, those who want to follow God's Ten Commandments, they're doing what, Hillary? 
They're grieving the they Holy Spirit. They are grieving the Holy Spirit of God. But you know, Pope Francis isn't the only one that's pushing this propaganda yes. because Obama is speaking the same language. Yes. Pope Francis is meeting with these media giants and they're uh, trying to fight and stop online bullying and online uh, slandering, etc., and trying to shut down the so-called prophets of doom. So it's not just Pope Francis. You see it from the religious side, but you also see it from uh, the social media side. You see it from politicians. Everybody's talking about shutting down fundamentalists, mm -hmm. the fundamentalism, and they're tying, you know, Islamic extremists to those that are fundamentalists. Mm -hmm. And so we see it from every angle. And the people are just being bombarded, you know, with this propaganda. So right. what are they going to think mm -hmm. about those who are upholding the commandments of God? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just as in Rwanda, you had the Vatican on one side. Then you had France, the U.S., the U.N., as well as uh, the Belgian government with the Christian Democratic, Democratic Party. Party. You see that now? Mm -hmm. Just like today, you have your apostate Protestants who are saying that we need to quell free speech. The Pope is saying that. Obama is also saying right. that we must all unite. And those who preach against unity are terrorists. Right. And, 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 and what is being pushed forward is globalism. One world government, one world religion. Friends, the propaganda machine is here. It's at what, work. What are we going to do? Are we going to stand for God? Then, friends, if we stand for God, we are going to be labeled cockroaches, serpents, divisive, bigots. Communists, even. Communists, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Look at this. It says Trump. What did the Pope say? Those who build walls are not what? Are Christian. Not Christian. See, the propaganda machine is here. Trump was only a straw man. Mm -hmm. Make sense? A straw man? Yes. Because really, he wants to get, he's dealing with those who want to separate from his agenda and do not want to unite. Those people are not Christian. Correct. What did they call the Tutsis who refused to unite? with the Vatican and church and state. They are not Christians. But you know, uh, even Donald Trump, not to get, not to veer too far off the subject, but even he has succumbed to the pressure because now he's backtracking on what he said, you know, regarding the wall. He's backtracking on, com um, on the uh, climate change. Mm -hmm. He's backtracking on a lot of the issues that Pope Francis is pushing. And so he's being pressured and we'll see what happens in the very near future with the, that. The propaganda machine is here. Who did he call those who refused to unite with him? They're called Extremist. what? Extremists. Extremists. And who were those in Rwanda, the Tutsis, who mm -hmm. refused to unite with the Vatican? What were they called? Extremists. Friends, right. again, those who refuse to study God's word, the prophecies, they are bidden to read the lesson in the histories of nations. Look at this, at minute marker, 16 minutes, 10 seconds. Hillary, what it says here. Tutsis were thrown in prison wow. for protesting against the Vatican, controlling the government leaders of Rwanda. What? What thrown does that mean, Hillary? Prisons. They, so, they, kinda like an inquisition. That's it. So yeah. they were thrown in prison, why? Because the Tutsis were protesting. Right. That church leaders, the Vatican, Roman Catholic leaders, bishops, archbishops should not be influencing Running. civil leaders, yes. controlling Correct. civil leaders to now legislate church policies. But, and because mm -hmm. they protested that, the Tutsis were thrown weird. In prison. But even, they also had their lands confiscated. Yeah. They had their properties yes. confiscated. Yes. They, they just had all of their rights basically revoked at the hands of the government because they they were separatists. Now, listen to what the statement says. We're going now to the book, Great Controversy, page 605. Let's begin on page 607, the chapter entitled, the, the Last and Final Warning. It says this, the church appeals to the strong arm of civil power. And in this work, papists and Protestants unite as the movement for Sunday enforcement becomes more bold and decided. The law will be invoked against commandment keepers, 
they will be threatened with fines and imprisonment. Now understand that. So when we read Great Controversy and we see what is to come, remember now, this has already been. Not sometime in the 1500s, 1300s, the 1200s. No, we are talking about 1994. Right. 22, 22, 22 years ago. Chapter 13 with me. Revelation, go there with me. Chapter 13. So those who protested, the Vatican, the church and state connection, they were thrown in prison. And we're told in great controversy, uh, in, in the book, the Revelation, chapter 13, that those who stand firm to God's truth, proclaim the present truth, those who uphold God's Ten Commandments, we are told they will not be able to buy or sell. And just as Hillary brought out, the Tutsis lost their land, their, their, their farms, their homes, their livelihood. Friends, this was 1994. It is coming again. Write down testimonies for the church. Uh, that was verse 15 through verse 17 in the book, The Revelation. But write down uh, volume 5, page 81. The time is not for distant when the test will come to every soul. The mark of the beast will be enforced upon all. And those who have step by step yielded to worldly demands and conformed to worldly customs will not find it a hard thing to yield to the powers that be rather than sub subject themselves to derision, threaten, imprisonment. imprisonment, fines, and death. The contest is coming. Are we ready? And see, we see the escalation here. This, this just says imprisonment, but we see what happened, you know, in 1994. And even before that, in 1960, there was a smaller, on a smaller yes. scale, there was an uprising, there was a, a genocide as well that took place. Hillary. Read this, Minute Marker 1930, okay. what it says here. It says that Pope John Paul II visited Rwanda in September of 1990, approximately three and a half years before the genocide in April to June of 1994. <laughs> That's startling. He went to Rwanda three and a half years before the genocide began. We know what his, his meeting was about. We the, know exactly what it was about. Now we're seeing it. Mm -hmm. Three and a half years, September 1990. 91 September, that's one year. Right. September 92, that's two years. September 93, that's three years. Mm -hmm. From September of 93, you count six or seven months, you come to April 94. Three and a half years. Yeah. And notice now, when did Pope Francis make his historic visit to the United States of America. What year was that? 2015, September. September mm -hmm. again. Right. 2015. So friends, if it was to happen, the great persecution upon God's people in the last days, in the mark of the beast crisis, from September 2015, what is three and a half years in the future? Do the math. Now, we're not saying the mark of the beast will be enforced three and a half years from September 2015. But what if it is? What if it will? Am I ready? Do I have the faith to stand in that coming crisis? Do you have the faith to stand in this coming crisis? Friends, remember, those who refuse to read the lesson in God's book will be bidden to read it in, in the, the history. histories of nations. nations. But three and a half years is very significant yes. prophetically because, you know, after Christ was uh, crucified, three and a half years is what they had until the close of probation upon the Jews. Yes. Again, we're not setting dates, but mm -hmm. we're just saying over and over and yes. over, we see three and a half years. Three and a half when, years from his baptism that's right. to his crucifixion. And from there, the close of probation for the Jewish nation. Yes. That's right. And he even said, you know, these three years came I seeking for fruit. In, in, in Luke chapter 13, right. the fig tree. Mm -hmm. And also, if you go back and look at the history, oh friends, I love history. 
if you are a Bible student, you have to love history. We are told that when Cestius came down against Jerusalem hmm. in the year AD 66, do the research. He came down in the year 66 AD. When Titus came in the year 70 AD, it was approximately three and a half years. Wow. Why all these two and a half years? And Rome is always involved. It's in always yeah. that church man of state. sin. Church, church and state, state uniting. And notice again, notice again, the same three and a half years at Christ, again, Bible, at Christ, when he was baptized, it was three and a half years to his crucifixion. And what two entities united to crucify Jesus? Church it was state. church and state. Are we together? And notice again, Bible again. Going back to Christ's day, the Jews of Christ's day, the leaders, did they not want to unite with the Romans? Yes. Did absolutely. they not say, if we, uh, John 11, if we allow this man to carry on freely his ministry, then the Romans will come and take, and take, take away our place and, and our nation. So we have to get rid of him. And that's why they continued. In other words, they, they, they poured more gasoline, as it were, on the fire. They poured more, 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 in Fuel other words, the they began to prop up the propaganda machine, calling Christ and his followers Beelzebub, Be Beelzebub mm -hmm. the devil. These are troublers of, of the, the people. people. We have to get rid of them. And Jesus says, what happened to him is going to happen to us. As we follow him, we are reading these histories and lessons even in Rwanda. Look and, at this. And he was denounced as a Sabbath breaker. That oh, yes. was one of the primary charges that they brought against him. And we know that the crisis in the last days is over the Sabbath. Worship. Not the seventh day Sabbath, but the Sunday false Sabbath. Look at this. Hillary, read this for us. The Vatican had a monopoly on the education of the Rwandans. Rwanda was to become the Christian ideal the kingdom of God on the earth. Wow. So the Vatican wanted Rwanda to be one of its chief kingdoms, a nations mm -hmm, for the rest in of the Africa and to be a model for the rest of the nations, Rwanda. Now notice, it, they used education to control the people in Rwanda. So what God is telling us, if we want to see where the Jesuits are, where must we look? The education. Beginning at the earliest years, they begin indoctrinating them from, you know, two years or maybe even before then, but just indoctrinating them, inundating them with these uh, false teachings. And of course, if that's all they know, that's what they've been taught and that's what has been, you know, bombarding their minds, of course that's what they're going to believe. And most of the civil leaders in Rwanda, they were educated by Jesuits. Right. And most of the civil leaders in America are Jesuit educated and Jesuit trained. The majority of the Ivy League schools are what? Jesuit run schools. That's right. And that's why it's no wonder that the beast in Revelation 13 yes. is characterized having the body of a leopard. leopard. And if you go back to Daniel 7, we know that the leopard uh, beast was Greece, and the Greeks were known for their education, and albeit false education. Amen, amen. Mm -hmm. And 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 22, it says the Greeks were known for education. Hmm. That's why the body of the papacy in chapter 13 of Revelation is the body of a leopard. Now, notice here, it says uh, the Vatican wanted, back to the screen, wanted Rwanda to be the Christian ideal, the kingdom of God on the earth. Now, that's telling. Do you know why? Because does Satan want to set up a kingdom oh, yes. on this earth? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So Rwanda was to be that ideal. And he uses education, a monopoly, a centralization. Education. Education. So now, and because the Tutsis rejected the Vatican control, Vatican education, Jesuit education, and began to go independent of Roman Catholicism, they were the ones who were murdered Massively. mercilessly. So now, 
since the Vatican wanted to establish a kingdom of God on the earth, and then they killed the Tutsis, were these the only people in Rwanda who rejected the Vatican control? No. Remember, some were labeled communists. Right. But there were other groups of people in Rwanda who were not labeled communists. Right. But they also rejected Roman Catholicism right. in Rwanda. Friends, listen to me carefully. So once they targeted the Tutsis and uh, th that tribe as communists, anti-church and state, that was also, also a smoke, a straw man. Because the Vatican also wanted to destroy another group of people. Right. And that group of people was also a threat to the Vatican, to the Jesuits, hindering them from establishing their so-called kingdom. kingdom on the earth. So the question is, what was that group's name? The Seventh-day Adventist. Seventh-day Adventist. Know, viewing this from the perspective of the great controversy, yes. the real target were Seventh-day Adventists yes. because they keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Those were the real targets, not the communist only. The Seventh-day Adventists were who the Catholics had their eyes set upon to destroy. Amen. Just as they call the Tutsis communists mm -hmm. because they did not want to unite with the Roman Catholic Church, but in Rome's mind, she wants to get to that group of That's people. Right. Seventh-day Adventists. But see, she La knew that the world hated communism. Yes. You know, they feared it. There was, a, there was a phobia against communism. If you're a communist, wow, you're proscribed, you're cursed by God, you know. And so... Oh, Hillary. So are we now seeing then Pope Francis uh, replaying an application of the Red Scare? Let us put in people's minds that those who keep the Ten Commandments are divisive. Separatist. They're sick, mm -hmm. sick. They're separatists. They are hypocrites. They're fundamentalists. They're extreme in their minds. Right. Wicked. They are serpents, basically. He's poisoning the minds of people today. Right. And bear in mind, the majority of the Sunday-keeping churches have already begun to preach the Ten Commandments were what? Done away with. Done away with, with nailed to the cross. And so this them. one group mm -hmm. of people who are now upholding the Ten Commandments, they are sick people. That's right. And because they uphold the Ten Commandments, they are separatists. They are hindering us from having peace on the earth. Oh. We have to get rid of them. And those apostate Protestants who are uh, supposedly standing for the Ten Commandments, it's not the Ten Commandments of the Bible. It's the Ten Commandments of the papacy. It's a false Ten Commandments. Yes, yes, yes. Notice what this says here. Notice, notice, notice what this says here. Let's go back to the book of chapter 14 of Revelation. We, we are seeing it here. Chapter 14 of Revelation. Now notice. what this says, chapter 14 of Revelation, and look with me at verse, verse number six. Verse number six. Because remember now, if you look at what is uh, happening now even in, in America, even in America, people are now being targeted, so-called terrorists, Muslims, right? Mm -hmm. Muslims. And the Vatican is also behind that. Let us get rid of these Muslims. But who do they really want to get rid of? Primarily, Seventh-day Adventists. Seventh Adventist. Look at this here, friends. Look at this carefully. This is from Spectrum. This is just a few months ago. The headline reads, No Sanctuary. Hillary, go ahead. No Sanctuary in Muganero. Notes on Rwanda, Revival and Reform. Read that for us. Yet Rwanda at the time, at 1994, uh, was one of the world's most Christian nations. Over 90% of the population were professing believers. In fact, with more than 10% of the entire population being baptized Seventh-day Adventist, church leaders described Rwanda as the most Adventist country in the world. And this is why the 3,000 had fled to Muganero. Wait a minute. 
Again, what now? It says it was the world's most Christian nation. Mm -hmm. Rwanda. How, how could it be that over 90% of the population were professing believers? Yet the Tutsis were all labeled as, as communist? Yeah, couldn't be. Does that make sense to you, friends? Propaganda, lies. And look at this. Mm -hmm. In fact, with just let me just reread for emphasis, Hillary. In fact, with more than 10% of the entire population being baptized Seventh day Adventists, church leaders describe Rwanda as the most Adventist country in the world. And where did the Vatican desire to set up its kingdom? In Rwanda. Wow. Let that sink in. And let's come full circle to the application for the last days. Which nation today is the nation to where the pilgrims fled from papal persecution? Mm -hmm. The United States of America. So which nation does uh, the Jesuits, do the, the have Jesuits their have their eyes on to set up their ideal? The glorious land. Mm -hmm. Oh, we've seen this, my friend. That simply yeah, means the then States. that Seventh-day Adventists were among the victims who died in Rwanda. Yes. Look at this carefully, friends. And not only, hear me, not only were Seventh-day Adventists massacred, maimed, butchered in Rwanda as victims, but even Seventh-day Adventist leaders were also the mobsters, the perpetrators, killing their own Seventh-day Adventists. Brothers and sisters, their own, um, their own members. Read this for us. So now what we friends, hear me. So here we find Seventh-day Adventists killing their own people. Not only people from their tribe, but also people of their own faith. Right. What caused this? Their minds were poisoned by this false education. Yes, the but yet we cannot take away the responsibility or the culpability from them, you know, themselves. Yes, yes. But they were products of this ecumenical yes, church and state yes. uh, government. And, and so, they believed those that wanted separation basically were threats to the nation. And so yes. they joined in with the killings. But which they is were the seven day Adventists, Hillary? Well, professing. So now a time came in Rwanda when Seventh-day Adventism meant nothing to Seventh-day Adventists. They were on the side of the Vatican, wow. the Jesuits. Ecumenism. Is that coming again? Yes, it is, unfortunately. Again, those who refuse to learn the lesson from God's book, GC 285, will be bidden to read the lesson in the history of nations, the Guardian. Hillary, read this for us. And these are secular papers, so this isn't coming from a biased perspective. And as we were doing the research, there were many. Oh, this is a well-known oh, fact, yes. you know. This was a yes. well-known fact, and many of the secular papers carried it. And it's the most saddening part of the entire ordeal. But it said a Rwandan Seventh-day Adventist pastor and his son, who had a church roof removed to expose Tutsi refugees to Hutu attackers, were convicted of genocide by the UN War Crimes Tribunal for Rwanda yesterday. Elisa Fan, uh, 78, and his son Gerard, 45, mm -hmm. a doctor, were found guilty of herding families into the church and summoning the Hutu militia to butcher them. It was one of the more notorious of the 1994 bloodbath massacres. The two men were convicted of genocide, complicity in genocide, conspiracy to commit genocide, and crimes against humanity for aiding the slaughter at the Seventh-day Adventist compound in Kabui. No, that's talking. Read on here. Elisa Fan, president of the Seventh-day Adventist West Rwanda area, was one of the many clerics, one of the many clerics accused of complicity in the genocide and the first to be convicted by the tribunal. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison and his son was given 25. 
this is the most emotional, sad part of the whole presentation, that a Seventh-day Adventist pastor, pastor now, he allowed, he, he, he literally gave call to his members and others, come over here, hide in the church. Come on, come on the church come compound. Seek refuge. seek refuge in the church. And once they came in, he backed out. And he was seen riding his bike with the other militia men. They began to, yeah. they, they severed all water, um, water lines, water water lines coming into the compound. Food was also cut off from the compound. And then he was seen beckoning to the killers to come in and slaughter his own people. Now, this is a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. Now, look with me in the book of Amos. Hillary, just get the, that history for us. Mm -hmm. Amos, go to Amos for me. Amos, Amos chapter 5. Amos chapter 5. And again, friends, oh, friends, how could this be a Seventh-day Adventist pastor Look at this. Amos chapter 5 verse 18 says, Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. As if a man did flee from a lion and a bear met him. Or went into the house, into the house, the church, and leaned his hand on the wall and a serpent bit him. These people were running into the house seeking refuge. And the very pastor turned them over to the killers. Right. They were fleeing from the lion, you know, fleeing from, from the Roman Catholics. Read that Babylon. Us, Listen carefully what this says. It says, according to journalists and human rights investigators, Pastor Elisaphan and Takuratamana a Hutu and then president of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in the Kabui region urged Tutsi members of his congregation as well as others to take shelter in the Muganero Adventist compound. Now this compound had a church, a hospital, and also a school. Mm -hmm. Many also came without prompting from the surrounding bush avoiding countless militia checkpoints in a harrowing flight for refuge on the Adventist property. Survivors, however, say that any hope of sanctuary at Muganero soon vanished. Hmm. Water lines were first severed. Then all roads into the mission were cordoned off by Hutu police. On April 15th, as heavily armed Hutu bands and members of the Presidential Guard circled the compound in pickup trucks, wow. a group of seven Tutsi Seventh-day Adventist pastors signed a desperate letter to the pastor, Pastor Elisaphan, mm. who was seen riding about the periphery of the mission together with the roving militiamen. Journalist Philip Gorovich would later use a portion of their letter as the title to his award-winning report from Listen. the killing fields. Listen. We wish to inform you that tomorrow we will be killed with our families. So they wrote this, yes. They, yeah, I was just going to say seven pastors wrote a desperate letter hoping that Pastor Elisaphan would, would do something to help them. Now, and do you know what he said? That's okay. You need to die. There's nothing we can do. Read on. But part of the letter says this, Our dear leader, Pastor Elisaphan, how are you? We wish to be strong in all these problems we are now facing. We wish to inform you that we have heard that tomorrow we will be killed with our families. We therefore request you to intervene. <laughs> they were asking him to intervene here, here, here. on our behalf and talk with the mayor. We believe that with the help of God who entrusted you the leadership of this flock, which is going to be destroyed, your intervention will be highly appreciated. The same as the Jews were saved by Esther. Mm. We give honor to you. The answer to this plea came the next day. Sabbath morning. Sabbath. 
At approximately 9 o'clock a.m., the attackers advanced toward the church from all sides chanting, eliminate the Tutsis. They worked methodically with guns and machetes, moving from church to school to hospital. The victims, weak from food and water deprivation, mounted a feeble defense with bricks and stones, but they were overcome with little effort. The killers, keen to spare bullets, only paused when the physical exertion of chopping and spearing demanded rest. Mm. By evening, mop-up operations had begun. Tear gas was fired to cause any living Tutsis among the corpses to cry out. The attackers then made sure these joined the rest. You know, friends, sometimes we have to ask ourselves, are we reading just an account that is fiction? Or did this really take place? And since we know it did take place, the Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9, that which has been shall be. And in Matthew chapter 10, verse 36, Jesus told us, a man's foes shall be found where? Shall be found where? In his own household. In his own household. Now the question is, was this pastor and his son, look at the screen, look at them. Were these two men Jesuits themselves? If they were Jesuits themselves, then they were, they were wolves among the sheep. And if they were not Jesuits themselves, but were influenced by the Vatican. Bribed. That means they were hirelings. Right. Right. They sold out their own people, tribe, and then their own brothers and sisters in the faith. Do we not think these things are going to happen again? Hmm. Look at this statement here. Look at this statement here. It says in the same article, and, and this author has firsthand account of the genocide in Rwanda. He's from Africa. He says this, but the pastor and his sons were not the only Adventists who sided with the killers. In regions with large numbers of Seventh-day Adventists, the killings were just as bad as in the rest of the country. Quote, there were church-going people seen in the mobs cheering those who did the killings. Norte reported. Today, jails in Weir Friends, Rwanda, hold large numbers of Adventists who have been implicated in the genocide. Now, according to one high-level church official I spoke with at the union office in Kigali, not only Adventist lay members, but numerous Adventist pastors have been convicted by Rwanda's village level uh, Gaka, Gaka. Gaka courts for their role in genocidal crimes against humanity. During the genocide, he told me, some Adventists, let's read that. Everyone, come on, let's read that, what it says. Some Adventists maintain, maintain their, their Adventism, Adventism by, by scrupulously resting from killing on Sabbaths. Wow. This, this really reminds me. In other words, yeah. When it was time to slay more people who did not want to join with the Vatican and church and state, some said, I won't kill on the Sabbath. But as soon as Sunday came around, as, as the sun set, they, they drew their machetes and their weapons and went butchering men, women, boys, and girls. What does that sound like? Yeah. The crucifixion with Jesus. Mm -hmm. and Do you want to read it? Go to John 19 with me. Yes, sir. You were saying. That was the point I was going to yes, make. Yes. Yeah. They, they wanted to keep, yes. the, they were so zealous, you know, yes. to keep the Sabbath yes. that they had to get Christ's body down off the cross before sunset so they could keep not only Sabbath, but also Passover. And this is, this, this account is another confirmation point that Bible truth is truth. 
Right. It's factual. It did take place because history did repeat in 1994. It did. Two witnesses. And how many do we need to establish a point? Two or three. Okay. In John, it, in John 19, go ahead, Hillary, verse 31, John 19. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the bodies should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was an high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. For what purpose? So what they were they hurrying the to go and do? To go and keep the Sabbath, just as those killers in Rwanda. Now, someone might say, Pastor, that was in the past. Are these things going to happen again? Oh, yes. Well, go one ahead. report even said that um, some of the uh, mobsters, when they went about killing, they had their Bibles in one hand, machetes in the other hand, and they were actually singing hymns. So can you imagine they're singing Adventist hymns while they're slaughtering, you know, people, their, innocent people, no, their, their own, own people. people and their own brothers and sisters in the faith. Now, I believe, well, let me ask a question. Do you believe some of these uh, killers knew, knew the sanctuary message? Yeah, intellectually, they weren't, they weren't um, sanctified Do you, think, do you think some of them talked about health reform? Yeah, huh? they definitely talked about Sabbath reform. Exactly. So you see, so you see, most of these people in 1994 professed Seventh-day Adventists. They upheld our cardinal doctrines. Yet, they killed their own people, their own brothers and sisters in the faith because they were poisoned by the messages of propaganda from church and state. Those people don't want to unite. Right. So when we look at movements within Seventh-day Adventism now, that's why on the monitor here, we are seeing now Adventists uniting with the Vatican, with Popery. We can now tell what the end result is going to be. Is everyone following me so far? Mm -hmm. We saw what the end result was when the civil leaders, when Seventh-day Adventists, professed ones, in Rwanda, joined hands with the Vatican. What was the end result? Seventh-day Adventist Christians killed their own people right. and brothers and sisters, children of their own faith. So now when we see Ganun Diop joining hands with the Pope of Rome, Pope Francis, what is going to be the end result? When we see Oakwood University every single Sunday, every single, the first week of every December, uniting with Sunday pastors as the keynote speaker mm -hmm. for the pastoral evangelism, leadership, leadership a um, conference or council, we can see what the end result is going to be. Right. When we see the one project, preachers, Jaffet, Alex Bryan, Sam Leonore, and the rest, uniting with uh, Leonard Sweet and those men from the emerging church movement, what is going to be the end result? Mm -hmm. When we see the pastor here in Florida from Forest Lake and the other churches downloading Willow Creek preachers, Joining with Willow Creek, Rick Warren, T.D. Jakes. What is going to be the end result of this ecumenical movement? Can we see what's coming? Again, those who refuse to believe the prophecies may read them in the histories of nations. What is going to be the end result? Because now we are hearing we are too separ uh, separate. We must Did learn to unite with the other churches because we are all the church of God. Yeah, but the church never, um, the, well, when you uh, adopt these worldlings, you're not converting them to Christ. They're converting you to their, uh, their errors and doctrine. But we see the seeds being sown in the books that are being yes. sold at our book centers, yes. the Sabbath school lessons that are, um, yes. those are the educational seeds yes. that are being uh, yes. uh, 
put in people's yes. mind yes. to accept this ecumenical movement. And what happened to the Tutsis when they began to protest against the Vatican's control over their lives, their country, and even their churches? Where were they placed? In prison. In prison. And those who protest against the ecumenical movement, within Seventh-day Adventism, they are being marginalized. Mm -hmm. And if they listen to me, friends, Father in heaven, give us understanding, we pray. Let these not just be words from a man, but speak to us, your children. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, friends, I believe if there was such a round table, such a panel discussion in, in January of 1994, four months before April of 1994, saying, Tootsies, saying Seventh-day Adventists, let's not unite with this ecumenical movement, with the Vatican, they would have said, oh, come on, Seventh-day Adventists. Nothing is wrong with that. But now looking back, what was the end result? Look, look here, great controversy, page 608. So what's going to happen to those who protest against the apostasies in the church? We are going to be marginalized. We are going to be ostracized. We are going to be called divisive. That these people do not want to unite with the rest of us. They are troublers of Israel. Mm -hmm. What happened to Elijah when he was protesting against he was church hunted. and state? The, a death decree Who went out. Who hunted him? Ahab and Jezebel. Who was Ahab? The king of Israel. Of which church? Uh, the Jewish church. So friends, can you see this, friends? Look at this. In GC 608, it says this. Do you have it there, Hillary? Mm -hmm. As a storm. As a storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message, but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth, yes. abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. By uniting with the world and partaking of its spirit, they have come to view matters in nearly the same light. And when the test is brought, they are prepared to choose the easy, popular side. Now, who are these people? People who have once professed faith in the third angel. Wait message, a minute. And what do they saying. do now? They, they become... Join the opposition. They join the opposition. So, friends, have we ever seen these words fulfilled? Based on what we are studying, when? 1994. Would it happen again? Come on, friend. Notice, this, this, this prophecy in GC 608 is not talking about the progressive, liberal, snowflake element within Seventh-day Adventism. Yes, snowflake Seventh-day Adventist. This is talking about those who profess faith in what? The third angel's message. In other words, they believe in the sanctuary. They believe in the investigative judgment. They believe and can quote uh, dates and prophecy, health message, dress reform, all of it. Even the mark of the beast oh, message, yes. but they're fulfilling it on the wrong side. Wow. These things make me tremble, my friends. Lord, yeah. hold me. Lord, convert me. Lord, convert me. Mm -hmm. Because if I am not converted, I am going to yield to the seeds of Satan. Lord, convert me. We have to be sanctified through obedience That's to the it. truth. Finish it up. Finish Men up, of talent and pleasing address who once rejoiced in the truth employ their powers to deceive and mislead souls. They become the most bitter enemies of their former brethren. When Sabbath keepers are brought before the courts to answer for their faith, these apostates are the most efficient agents of Satan to misrepresent and accuse them, and by false reports and insinuations to stir up the rulers against them. Do you know why Save to Serve Local and those online, why we're bringing this, this history out from Rwanda? Two points. Number one, many Seventh-day Adventists who are well-read heard about this history in Rwanda, and, and they knew Seventh-day Adventists were implicated were found guilty. By the way, I'll come back there. Do you know the pastor and his son who were uh, sentenced, uh, they were imprisoned for committing the, the crime against the Tutsis in Rwanda. 
that they were put in prison by a UN committee. Hmm. And in the documentary and other research from high-level journalists, historians, they bring out solid, concrete proof that the United Nations, the leaders, Lent their support. Um, what's his name from Africa? Uh, uh, Kofi, Kofi Annan. Oh, no. mm -hmm. They all knew the genocide was going to happen. Yeah. And, and they, they said nothing. They supported the Hutu government. Yes. Yeah, the UN knew. It. U.S. knew. France knew. They all knew it was going to happen. I said nothing. And that was under the Clinton administration when Bill Clinton was in office. Bill Clinton was implicated in it. It said the Clinton connection with Rwanda. That's, that's for some other time. And all they did was get some fall guys. Fall guys, just take the fall, and then they moved on. Oh, we should have done something. We could have done something. Friends, they knew. Concrete evidence. What now? Just like, well, September 11, 2001, they knew. But who was the one controlling the United Nations? You see, these things are the fruit. What's at the root? Jesuitism. And, uh, yeah, ahead, and uh, they're, they're so deceptive because even the Pope, after the genocide was taking place, was, you know, made a statement that we need to stop you know stop the killing stop we the need killing. to bring about peace so we see here that they are creating the problems they're behind the scene orchestrating events yes. to bring about chaos and to bring about genocide and the slaughtering of countless people but yet they're in the front saying you know uh let's bring peace let's bring the killings to an end when they're behind you know bringing in weapons and you know empowering the the murderers now can i go back mm -hmm. now you know what was interesting is that many of the killers, as you brought up, they were singing, they were praying, they worshiped before they went and killed the Tutsis. And I remember in the Bible, there was a group of men who said, we have to kill Paul. And we're gonna fast and yeah. pray until we kill Paul. Right. Do what? Fast and pray. They're going to fast. They won't eat. They won't drink until they kill Paul. They made a covenant with death and hell because they covenanted. They made a solemn covenant. Back to the point. The second point why we are rehearsing this account in Rwanda, because many Seventh-day Adventists say, and look how prejudiced they are. Those people in Rwanda were backward, ignorant people, and that's why they killed their own people and brothers and sisters of their own faith. But remember now, what happened then, inspiration says, will happen again. Now, we have been aware the Jesuits, the Seventh-day Adventists, were a part of the massacre of the Tutsis in Rwanda. But not until recently, the Jesuits of Rome, the Catholic Church, came out publicly and admitted, yes, our priests, yes, our nuns, friends, nuns, nuns were also killing men, women, boys, and children in Rwanda. Catholic Church said that. This is linking now the union between the Seventh-day Adventist professed ones and the Vatican in mass massacring killing those who refuse to join in the ecumenical movement and to support the Roman Catholic Church. Look at this statement here. This is uh, from Crux, the Catholic website, and Fox News. Hillary, read that for us. All right. The, he the headline says, Rwanda, Catholic bishops apologize for role in genocide. Yes. The Catholic Church in Rwanda apologized on Sunday for the church's role in the 1994 genocide saying it regretted the actions of those who participated in the massacres. The statement acknowledged that the church members planned, aided, and executed the genocide in which over 800,000 ethnic Tutsis and moderate Hutus were killed by Hutu extremists. Many of the victims died at the hands of priests, clergymen, and nuns, according to some accounts by survivors. And the Rwandan government says 
many died in the churches where they had sought refuge. Wow. And what are we told in GC 571? But that's startling yes. because they're they're basically implicating the seventh day that last sentence they're Let's implicating the seventh Let's day Adventist back. church in Muganero, that yes. compound there. It says again what now? Many? Many died in the churches where they had sought refuge. Which churches? You see? Yeah. It is so, well known mm -hmm. of the Seventh day Adventist compound. Right. That church, that school and hospital right. where many went to and were butchered by their own people. And by pastors and leaders, people that they look to as their protector, as their shepherds. But, but they, to show the ecumenical uh, link again, there were other, uh, not just Roman Catholics and Seventh-day Adventists, but as we were doing the research, we found Pentecostals. that Pentecostals yes. were involved in it, Baptists, mm -hmm. I mean, apostate Protestants from pretty much all of the different denominations. So it was ecumenism along with church and state. So do we see where ecumenism is going to lead again? Right. Look at this. Even though she apologized, what does the Lord's messenger say in GC 571? The Roman church now presents a fear front to the world, covering with apologies her record of horrible cruelties. She has clothed herself in Christ-like garments. But she's what, Hillary? She is unchanged. She's unchanged. Every principle of the papacy that existed in past ages exists when? Today. Today. The doctrines devised in the darkest ages are still held. held. Let none deceive themselves. Wow. The papacy that Protestants are now so ready to honor is the same that ruled the world in the days of the Reformation when men of God stood up at the peril, at the peril, one more time, at the peril of their lives to expose her iniquity. So what's going to happen to those who stand up now, true Protestants, to expose her iniquity? Persecution is right. coming. Go right. to John 17 with me. Look at the prayer of Christ. And that's why as we bring this to a close, I want us to, to, to understand that we are very, very close to the repetition of the genocide that took place in Rwanda. The only difference is it's going to be worse. Mm. It's going to be worse. And I want to know, Lord, do I have the faith to go through this time period? Do you have the faith safe to serve? Lord, help us. In John 17, and I believe if you had told those Tutsis that that day would come, what would many have said? Alarmist. Yeah, you're, you're a mere alarmist. I don't and know one reason why many would not have believed, they would say, but these are our own people. See? On tribe. And number two, what else? These are our brothers. Right, in the faith. In the faith. We, we go to church together. Mm -hmm. We knock on doors together. They must have had evangelism campaign. Oh, yes. They all sat in the same church around the same table to have lunch. They knocked on doors. They prayed for outsiders to come into the church, the truth. Right. And yet, the same ones butchered them. Yeah, and in the end, there were only two groups, the persecutors and the persecuted. John 17, it says in verse 14, Hillary, verse 14, what does Christ say here in verse 14? I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Verse 15. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world. But what? But that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. So what is a prayer of Christ? Knowing he knows what is coming upon us. Lord, Father, keep them. Because a crisis is coming. Go to John 15 with me. John chapter 15. And Christ says here in verse number 18, he says, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Verse 20, Remember the word that I said unto you, The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will also keep yours also. Verse 21. But all these things 
would they do unto you for my name's sake? Because they know not him that sent me. And then Christ says now in verse number, in verse number 20, verse 26, verse 25, but this cometh to pass that the word might be fulfilled that is written in the law. They hated me without a what? A cause. A cause. Verse 26, but when the comforter is come. Amen. So notice now, when Christ spoke about the coming comforter, that we must receive the Holy Spirit. It's in the context of a coming crisis. Persecution. Look at verse, verse mm. 1 of chapter 16. Hillary, read that for us, what it says here. These things have I spoken unto you, that ye should not be offended. Yes. They shall put you out of the synagogues, yea, and who is the they here? They shall put you out of the synagogues, yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. Verse 3. And these things will they do unto you, because they have not known the Father nor me. So now, if they are going to put us out of the synagogue, where were they also? In the, in, the, in the church. And look what Christ says next in verse 4. But these things have I told you, that when the time shall come, you may what? Remember. Remember, friends. Remember that I told you of them, and these things I said not unto you at the beginning, mm. because I was with you. So Christ is saying, I didn't tell you these things before. At the beginning, I was with you. But now I'm going to be taken away. So you need to understand what is coming. And that the same persecution that befell me, Christ is saying, is going to befall you. And yet people say, we don't want to hear about last day events. Right. But what did Christ do? He prepared his followers for what? was to come. For Friends, three and a half years he did that. How mm -hmm. would you feel? How would you feel if danger is ahead? I know danger is ahead. You and I are close companions and I don't tell you to be weird. How would you feel it? Betrayed. Betrayed. Yeah. So Christ says now, I'm going to tell you before it happens that when it comes, you would not be taken by surprise and that you may remember what I said unto you. Notice now, the two things he said. Not only that the crisis is coming, but that you need the comforter. Mm. You, need the you need the indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God. Because only with Him, His power, will you be able to endure the coming crisis. crisis. He says in verse 5, But now I go my way to Him that sent me. And none of you asketh me, whither goest thou? Verse 6, what it says now, verse 6. But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath wow. filled your heart. So how did they feel when they heard about the coming crisis? Right. Sorrowful. Sorrowful. Fearful. But what did he say now in verse 7? Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, mm. the comforter, comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Is, is that a promise from God? Yes. So can we claim it? Amen. Should we believe it? Mm -hmm. That even though we see how near we are to the coming crisis, we must also believe comfort is available for us. Amen. Strength is available for us. Somebody is there to fight with me, to fight my battle. Because it's not my battle. The battle is whose? It's the Lord's. It's the Lord's. Amen. So when I find myself in straight places, now and then, should I be encouraged or remain sorrowful? Be encouraged. encouraged. You know, friends, in closing, let me say this. It's the same scene with Peter. The same scene with Peter. When Christ was saying, Peter, tonight the shepherd shall be smitten and the sheep shall scatter. And all of you shall be offended because of me. Mm -hmm. And what did Peter and the others say? Be it far from thee. Lord, I'm going to stand. Mm -hmm. We're going to stand. And once Peter spoke in Matthew's account, the others said, likewise. But when the crisis came, what happened? They all 
What happened? Forsook him. They weren't yeah, ready, friends. They weren't you ready. see, friends, right now, all these studies are beautiful. It's very, let's say, uh, um, uh, palatable and plausible for us now to sit here and say, oh, look what happened, look what's coming. But friends, we are told in GC 622 that the time of trouble such as never was is soon to open upon us and that we shall need an experience which we do not now, now possess. possess and which many are too indolent to obtain. It is often the case that trouble is greater in anticipation than in reality. But this is not the case of the terrible ordeal before us. In other words, many times my mother would say, or my father, son, when you get home, I'm going to fix you. And the anticipation of that whipping mm -hmm. many times was more frightening than getting the actual right. whipping. Now, sometimes now, sometimes. <laughs> But inspiration says, what we read off, what we hear is coming. It says, when it really hits, it's going to be worse than any mind can ever conceptualize. Wow. Can you imagine? So even when we read the history of the Dark Ages, the Inquisition, Rwanda. Rwanda, Rwanda. We can't even compare it to that. I mean, wow. I saw babies, one, one little boy. He couldn't be any older than about six years of age. He was walking around with the journalist, the researcher, and he was taking the researchers through um, the bodies, uh, the graves, mm -hmm. um, the, mass, the mass graves, skulls and bones, and he pointed, that's my mother. Friends, tears came to my eyes. And he was asked, so how do you escape? He said, the man raised his hand to chop him and the hand just stood up in the air and he ran and he hid. I said, that was God. And I remember even with the Protestants, many times when the Protestants were about to be slain, mm -hmm. a hand was raised with a baton to whip the Protestant and the mobster took his other hand and pat his head. <laughs> Oh, what nice hair you have. Mm -hmm. And the Protestant was speared. And you laugh, you chuckle. But friends, that was God preserving his people. Yet we are told, for some, what is coming is going to be a great, great crisis. Do we have the faith now to meet that crisis? And God said to Peter and the rest, watch and pray. Watchfulness is needed. Prayerfulness is needed. Lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing. Don't trust the flesh. The flesh is weak. Who believes the flesh, the flesh is weak? Raise your hand. Who believes the flesh right now? We can't make it. Friends, that's the first step in preparation. Lord, I am weakness, full of weakness. The songwriter says, mm -hmm. at thy sacred feet I bow. Mm -hmm. Bless divine, eternal spirit, come and feel me when? Now. Feel me now. Mm -hmm. Feel me now. Feel me now. Jesus, come and feel me now. Feel me with thy hallowed presence. Come, oh come, and feel me now. We need this experience. I see my need. Did you comprehend what we covered today? Who did? Who did? Amen. Do we all see our need? Because I see my need. Do you all see your need Amen. to be filled right now? Yes, friends. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we are thankful this evening for this opportunity to study your words, looking at sacred history, through the lenses of the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Seeing what happened just 22 years ago and what is happening now and what is soon to return. Dear Lord, we pray for your people that we will not have a form of godliness yet denying 
the power thereof. Because we have seen what the form of godliness will yield. We'll become persecutors of our own people and those of our own faith. Lord, we pray for every Seventh-day Adventist. We pray for their conversion. We pray for their salvation. We pray for us, your children. We pray for the souls that we have to go now and warn who are in Babylon, who are making friends with the enemies of Jesus, to call them from the fold of darkness into your marvelous light. Dear Lord, keep us near the cross because there's a precious fountain. It's free to all, a healing stream that flows from Calvary's mountain. Keep us, dear God, because we cannot keep ourselves. The flesh is weak, and we thank you for the promise. The Spirit indeed is willing. Mm -hmm. So, dear God, today we put our will on your side. Give us now actions in accordance with our will, our faith. Save us, we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to thank you again, Safe to Serve Local and